All right, moving on with chapter four. We're picking up with section 4.7 that's titled Organelles Containing DNA. There are two organelles besides the nucleus that contain DNA. They are the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. Now remember, chloroplasts are only found in plant cells and in algae cells, like the cells of seaweeds. Mitochondria are found in all eukaryotic cells. They're found in plant cells, animal cells, fungus cells, and protist cells. Now, both of these organelles, the mitochondria and the chloroplast, contain their own DNA, little circular chromosomes of DNA. And of course, this DNA is separate from the DNA in the nucleus. Uh, the DNA in the nucleus makes up the vast majority of DNA in a cell, and that DNA is controlling the uh, processes of life in a cell. Uh, the DNA in a mitochondria or chloroplast uh, doesn't contain very much information, and uh, it is helping to make proteins that are only found in those organelles. Both of these organelles, mitochondria and chloroplasts, are involved in energy metabolism. So let me say a note about that before I move on to the mitochondria. So uh, mitochondria uh, take energy-rich molecules and break them down to release their energy. And the energy that's released is used to make what's called ATP. And we will cover that in more detail before this uh, course is finished. Chloroplasts build organic molecules that are rich in energy, and they do that through the process of photosynthesis. So let's talk about mitochondria first, some specifics. In the next slide will go over chloroplasts. So the structure of mitochondria. They're surrounded by a double membrane. There's two membranes, one inside the other. The outer membrane is pretty smooth, kind of like a big bubble going around the whole thing. And then the inner membrane, which is just inside of that, okay, just inside of that, uh, is highly folded back and forth and back and forth folds. And these folds are called Christi. The reason why the inner membrane is so highly folded is it uh, greatly increases the surface area. It increases the surface area to be able to do more energy metabolism. Okay, now there's two compartments inside mitochondria. One of the compartments is called the intermembrane space. And it's a shallow little space in between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. And it's going to be important a little bit later. The uh, compartment in the center of the mitochondria is called the matrix. And there's a lot of important chemistry that goes on there. We'll hear about it later. But this is the overall structure of a mitochondria. Outer membrane inner membrane that's highly folded with an intermembrane space and a matrix. What are mitochondria used for? What's their function? They use oxygen. This is why we breathe. It's the only reason why you breathe is to supply oxygen to your mitochondria. They use oxygen to extract energy from sugars and fats two energy-rich molecules to make ATP. ATP is a little energy molecule that powers all the processes and cells that need energy. I refer to ATP as the electricity of a cell. Electricity powers everything in our homes, and everything in our businesses. Doesn't matter what you're powering, a vacuum cleaner, a computer, whatever, you need electricity. When it comes to cells, all cells use a common energy source to power everything they do, and that energy source is this little molecule called ATP. Now, the chemical process that 
breaks down sugars and fats to make ATP is called oxidative metabolism. And again, we will cover it in detail a little bit later. Finally, the number of mitochondria that a cell has corresponds with the energy needs of the cell. So, for example, muscle cells, which are very active, uh, involved with movement, have lots of mitochondria. Probably a runner-up to that in our bodies are nerve cells that have lots of mitochondria and they need lots of energy for sending electrical signals. So now we're going to move on to the chloroplasts. So chloroplasts uh, also contain DNA, of course, and chloroplasts have a double membrane as well, an outer membrane and an inner membrane. But the inner membrane is not highly folded, like in mitochondria. It's smooth. I don't want you to know much about chloroplasts. Uh, we're not getting into the detailed chemistry of photosynthesis in this class, so I'm just uh, giving you a brief little overview. So they have this double membrane, and they have a whole bunch of interconnected sacs inside called thylakoids. And that uh, the thylakoids are where photosynthesis takes place, where energy from sunlight is absorbed and transferred to molecules to make uh, chemical energy. So the function of chloroplasts is photosynthesis, using light. Light is an energy source. And then the raw materials, the matter, that's used is carbon dioxide and water. And so those are the raw materials, the ingredients, carbon dioxide and water. Light is the energy source. And together, these make organic compounds like sugar, C6H12O6. And then I've got a note on the bottom here, chloroplasts are like nature's original solar panels, absorbing light, converting that light energy to make chemical energy, sugars. Of course, solar panels in today's modern societies are absorbing light energy and converting it to electricity. Pretty cool. So now let's talk about the endosymbiotic theory. That is, what is the origin of both mitochondria and chloroplasts? So both mitochondria and chloroplasts have remarkable similarities to bacteria. In fact, very specific types of bacteria. Biologists have been able to pinpoint or trace exactly which bacteria the mitochondria and the chloroplasts come from. And so endosymbiosis is when one cell lives inside of another cell. That's endosymbiosis. So we understand uh, that both mitochondria and chloroplasts came about when certain bacteria began to live inside eukaryotic cells, the eukaryotic cells of our ancestors, maybe up to 2 billion years ago. And what happened, most likely, is that a eukaryotic cell engulfed a prokaryotic cell, bacteria, and brought it inside. And once it brought it inside, then instead of destroying those cells, the bacteria began living inside the cells and helping out, basically paying rent. <laughs> the bacteria were really good at making ATP for energy, and the eukaryotic cell provided protection from other things in the environment. This is called symbiosis. Symbiosis is when two organisms live really close together, and in this case, they're helping each other out. Another example of symbiosis would be, well, the bacteria living in your mouth or living in your intestines or in outside in nature, uh, insects or birds that pollinate flowers. That's a symbiosis. So the bacteria were providing energy to the eukaryotic cell. The eukaryotic cell provided protection. 
Now, chloroplasts formed later, after mitochondria. How do we know that? Well, because not all eukaryotic cells have chloroplasts. Only some do. So it stands to reason that chloroplasts came about after the origin of eukaryotic cells. Now, how do we know this? What's the evidence? Because it always boils down to evidence. If we don't have evidence, then we're just telling stories. First of all, both mitochondria and chloroplasts have two membranes around them. You've heard this on the past two slides. The outer membrane is very, very similar to the plasma membrane of our own eukaryotic cells. The inner membrane is very, very similar to the plasma membrane of bacteria. Hmm, interesting. Uh, as you've heard, both mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA inside of them. Um, the DNA is circular, and it doesn't have any proteins attached to it. Hmm, what kinds of organisms have DNA like that? Well, prokaryotes do, like bacteria. Interesting. Um, also, mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own ribosomes inside of them. We're helping to make proteins. Those ribosomes are not like the ribosomes that are out in your uh, cytosol, uh, but those ribosomes in the mitochondria and chloroplasts are most similar to the ribosomes of bacteria. There's more. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts split into two and make new mitochondria and chloroplasts, and they do it just like bacteria do it. So I hope you're seeing here that there are several different pieces of evidence that point to bacteria as being the original source of where mitochondria and chloroplasts came from. Pretty interesting. Okay, next up is the cytoskeleton. This is section 4.8 in your textbook. Now, the cytoskeleton is not considered an organelle. It's a network of protein fibers that are spread out inside eukaryotic cells. Cytoskeleton is only found in eukaryotic cells, not found in prokaryotic cells, just like membrane-bound organelles, only found in eukaryotic cells. The cytoskeleton is made of three diff different kinds or different types of protein fibers, microfilaments, microtubules, and intermediate filaments. Those are the three. Uh, if you look at the uh, beautiful uh, image of a eukaryotic cell on the lower left corner of your slide. The uh, cytoskeleton is colorized. Um, microtubules are colored in green. Uh, microfilaments are colored in orange. And intermediate filaments are colored in blue. So what does the cytoskeleton do? Uh, well, one big job that it has is it helps to maintain cell shapes, giving them structure. Um, another important one is the cytoskeleton allows cells to move. If you're an amoeba, you're creeping around and changing your shape, or a white blood cell in our own bodies creeping around looking for bacteria or viruses to destroy. They're able to do that using the cytoskeleton. And then thirdly, the cytoskeleton is used to transport materials inside the cell using vesicles. So we're going to look at each one of these a little more closely on the next couple slides. This slide is introducing the cytoskeleton. Okay, first we're going to go over microtubules. So microtubules are hollow, hence the term tubule. And they're about 25 nanometers in diameter. That's pretty, pretty thin, pretty narrow, pretty tiny. 25 billionths of a meter. And microtubules are made of a protein called tubulin. Look at the figure in the bottom left. 
on the top of the figure. It's showing you some micrographs, uh, some pictures of um, cells under a microscope. And again, the green are microtubules. The blue is a nucleus. So just below that uh, micrograph, there's like a pipe-looking thing. And that's a microtubule. Okay? It's a hollow tube. And if we look at the detailed structure of that, it's made of those proteins called tubulins. So you can see all that labeled on the figure. So uh, what do microtubules do? What's their function? Well, first of all, put myself right there, microtubules help to maintain cell shape. Yeah, specifically, they function as compression-resisting girders. So a girder is like a big, strong beam going across the top of a building to give it shape and structure. Compression-resisting mean that they are resisting squishing forces. They're resisting outside forces that would compress or squish a cell. So microtubules are helping to prevent squishing. Another important function of microtubules is that they are like little railroad tracks that um, vesicles are moving along inside cells to go from one place to another. So microtubules are like railroad tracks for vesicles to move long distances. For example, when vesicles move from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi complex, they are riding along microtubules. When vesicles leave the Golgi and go to the plasma membrane, they are once again riding along microtubules. Take a look in the figure on the right uh, part of the slide. On the top there, it's showing you a microtubule, and there's a vesicle kind of resting on top, and then there's little motor proteins that are hanging down, and those motor proteins are called dynins and kinesins. And those motor proteins are help are moving, are kind of wiggling like little legs back and forth. And they're uh, crawling along the microtubule and carrying the vesicle along. Now just below that uh, cartoonish looking figure, there's an electron microscope image where you're actually seeing a couple vesicles moving along a microtubule. So captured that image, really, really tiny stuff. So there's microtubules. We're going to learn a little bit more about them on the next slide. <clears throat> so microtubules are also found inside flagella and cilia. And the microtubules cause the flagella or the cilia to bend back and forth, like in a waving action. And that's what allows many types of cells to swim through the water. Um, but in other cases, cilia bend back and forth on, uh, on cells that are inside of our bodies, for example, and help move things along, like a bunch of people in a crowd using their arms up in the air and like moving someone along above them. That would be kind of how cilia are moving things along. So let me mention that. Uh, and at the end of the slide. So flagella are very long, kind of snake-like, and they undulate back and forth like a snake. And uh, cells have one to several flagella. Uh, they're used, for example, by single-celled unicellular protists to swim. There's a couple of photos I put on the bottom left of the slide showing a couple different kinds of protists that use flagella, you can see the flagella, for swimming. Sperm cells also have a flagella that they use for swimming. And the figure I have on the right-hand side of the slide uh, shows you sperm cell with flagella. Singular is flagella. Cilia are much shorter. They have the same structure as a flagella, but they're much shorter. And they beat back and forth like oars, kind of. Power stroke, recovery stroke, power stroke, recovery stroke. So they move a little bit differently than flagella. They are also found on the outsides of some cells, lots of rows of them. And as the cilia are beating like oars, the cells can swim through the water. Uh, 
the figure over there on the right is showing you a tuft of cilia sticking out of some cells that are lining an oviduct in a female. They also are sticking out of cells lining your trachea, your windpipe going down to your lungs. In the case of an oviduct, the cilia are waving back and forth and pushing an egg down the oviduct. In the case of your trachea, the cilia are waving back and forth and pushing dust particles out of your airways uh, so they don't go in your lungs and then you swallow them. Almost every cell in your body, I don't think your textbook mentions this, has what's called a primary cilium, one single cilium that sticks up. Uh, the primary cilium is found on cells of most vertebrate animals, like fish and amphibians, reptiles and mammals, and it's used like a little antenna for signaling. Okay, let's move on. A little bit more about flagella and cilia. Now we're going to look at the internal structure. Internal structure. So they all have a, a common internal structure. So uh, flagella and cilia are attached to the cell body, the main part of the cell, uh, via what's called a basal body. So the basal body is embedded in the body of the cell, okay? the main part of the cell. And you can see in the figure, it's showing you on the far left uh, where a uh, cilium is attaching to the body of a cell. It's showing you the basal body. And then on the very bottom of the figure, it's showing you a cross section through a basal body, so a slice through a basal body. And what you can see is it's made up of, of triplets of microtubules, and there's nine triplets, all making like a, a ring, like the, the rim of a wheel. And then extending up into the cilium or flagellum are nine pairs of microtubules and one pair in the very middle. That's called a nine plus two structure. Nine pairs around the outside and then two more microtubules in the middle. On the upper right of that figure, it's a little artist's rendition, cartoony little picture, there's little red um, dynin proteins, those motor proteins that are sticking out and they're like little legs. And as they go walking along microtubules, they cause the microtubules to, to slide past each other. And as they slide past each other from these little dynin uh, protein motor molecules moving along, it causes the cilium or flagellum to bend back and forth. And that's what causes the waving action that makes cilia and flagella be used for movement. It's the sliding of microtubules past each other inside that makes the whole thing bend back and forth. And that's what I want you to know. Um, the way it all happens is pretty specific, but that's just an overall sort of idea of how they're working. Okay, now we're moving on to um, microfilaments. And microfilaments. Uh, are two intertwined strands, like two threads or strings that are twisted around each other of what are called actin proteins. So microtubules, you might remember, you should, are uh, made of tubulin proteins. So microfilaments are made of a completely different kind of protein called actin. And overall, microfilaments are really thin. They're only seven nanometers thick. And microfilaments are shown to you in the bottom left corner of the slide. So there's a cell. It's got red is coloring the microfilaments. You can see they're all over just on the inside of the cell. And then it's showing you these two twisted uh, threads around each other, like taking two strings and twisting them. And then on the very bottom of the figure, it's showing you the each one of those threads is made of those actin proteins. Let me just point out to you, because we've talked about uh, microtubules are made of tubulin proteins, microfilaments are made of actin proteins. Where do these proteins come from? They always come from ribosomes. 
Remember, ribosomes are making polypeptides, and the polypeptides are used to make proteins. Always, always the case. And the ribosomes are able to make those polypeptides using the genetic instructions from the nucleus, where the DNA is. So, you know, we've talked about this, but every time we're talking about proteins in cells and what the proteins do, just always remember that those proteins are made at the ribosomes and using genetic instructions that came from the DNA, the nucleus. Okay, so what do microfilaments do? Well, first of all, they help maintain cell shapes. Uh, remember, microtubules help to resist uh, squishing or compressing forces. Microfilaments help to resist pulling forces, stretching forces that would rip a cell apart. So there you go. We've got two kinds of uh, cytoskeleton protein fibers. One of them, microtubules, is, is uh, preventing cells from being squished, and microfilaments are preventing cells from being torn apart. Pretty handy. Um, microfilaments are found in muscle cells. And as the microfilaments uh, slide past each other, sliding past each other, they cause muscle cells to contract or get shorter. You'll learn about the details of that physiology in um, A and P, anatomy and physiology. A last point here is that microfilaments are also found in little tiny projections coming off of some cells, like the uh, epithelial cells in your small intestine. And those little finger-like projections are called microvilli. And each microvillus has microfilaments inside of it, crisscrossing, that help to uh, make the microvilla stand up straight so it doesn't flop over. So you can see that in the image on the bottom right. There's um, an electron microscope image of some microvilli, plural. They're surrounded by the plasma membrane of the cell. And you can see labeled there microfilaments that are extending up inside the microvilli to give them structure and shape. And then the figure also shows some of the last filaments we're going to talk about in just a moment called intermediate filaments. So the slide is showing you that there's a few important functions that microfilaments accomplish in cells. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the third type of cytoskeleton protein fiber called intermediate filaments. They're called intermediate filaments because their thickness is intermediate between microtubules, which are the thickest, and microfilaments, which are the thinnest. So they're intermediate in thickness. Intermediate filaments are very fibrous, and they are mostly made of keratin. So remember, keratin is the stuff in your fingernails or in your hair. It's a structural protein. Protein. Remember, like I said, proteins are made at your ribosomes using genetic instructions from the DNA in your nucleus. So once again, keratins are coming from that. Now these uh, fibrous proteins are supercoiled into thick cables. Take a look at the figure on the bottom of your slide. And they're really strong, they're really tough, and they're fairly permanent. They're not broken down and rebuilt like microtubules and, and microfilaments are. So intermediate filaments are helping to maintain permanent cell shapes, cell shapes that aren't changing. And they're also used to anchor certain organelles in place, to hold them in place, like the nucleus, for example, is sort of held in a scaffolding of intermediate filaments. So these, are, uh, these types of protein fibers, these intermediate filaments, are more permanent in structure, and they help to hold a more permanent cell structure, resisting shape changes. So there we go. That's finishing reviewing the three types of cytoskeleton protein fibers, microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. All right, we are now moving outside of 
eukaryotic cells and specifically we're moving to the outside of animal cells only animal cells on the outside of animal cells is an extracellular matrix abbreviated ecm sometimes biologists just call it the ecm uh, now these materials like everything in a cell is uh, made inside the cell so these materials are made at the endoplasmic reticulum proteins uh, carbohydrates they are sent to the golgi complex where they're refined modified uh, then sent to the plasma membrane and transport vesicles along those microtubules and then secreted and released to the outside and assembled into the extracellular matrix it's largely comprised of collagen, which is a structural glycoprotein. And by the way, collagen is the most abundant protein in our bodies. Uh, it's also made of other glycoproteins called proteoglycans. You can see those in the figure. Um, and fibronectins, they're also glycoproteins, GP for glycoproteins. And those are connected to integrins. The integrins are proteins in the plasma membrane. So there's lots of connections here. Uh, then those integrins are connected to the cytoskeleton, microfilaments in the cytoskeleton. So there's lots of connections here. Take a look at that figure. What is the extracellular matrix used for? Well, it holds cells together, forming strong sheets of tissue. So, for example, your muscle tissue, uh, your muscle cells are held together into sheets of tissue, very strong sheets of tissue with the extracellular matrix. Another function is the extracellular matrix transmits mechanical and chemical signals between cells to help coordinate their activities. This is uh, really common in developing embryos where cells need to be talking to each other to coordinate what they're doing uh, or in some tissues in our heart um, this uh, used there and other parts of our body. So there's a video that I hyperlinked here uh, talking about how the extracellular matrix can, uh, it can be used for uh, repairing tissues. Uh, wound healing. Check it out. Okay, the last thing I'm going over here in terms of eukaryotic cell structure has to do with intercellular junctions in animal tissues. And I didn't see this covered in your book, but uh, you should know about it. You really should. So um, now a junction is where things come together, where they meet, like highways when they meet and intersect we can say hey meet me at the junction of i-10 and uh, i-17 so these intercellular junctions are places where cells are connecting and meeting and they are forming connections between them um, they're especially common in epithelial tissues tissues that line the internal surfaces of our body or even that line our skin or epithelium. There are three types of junctions you need to know about. Tight junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions. And you can see desmosomes are also called anchoring junctions and gap junctions are also called communication junctions. So they're synonymous. Tight junctions, look at the figure, okay? It's a great figure showing you these things. Tight junctions are networks of proteins, like a mesh, they look like a mesh, that tightly seals adjacent membranes and prevents the leakage of fluids to the outside of cells. You don't have fluids leaking out of your body onto your skin, in part because of tight junctions that are sealing off your epithelial cells from the liquids and fluids inside your body. Um, you also have tight junctions uh, lining the cells of your intestines, sort of really helping to control the movement of fluids across those cells. Desmosomes, 
or anchoring junctions. They act like rivets or nails that are holding cells together in strong sheets like muscle tissue. Muscle cells have lots of desmosomes connecting them and tightly holds those cells together. Really strong. Again, take a look at the figure and there's a little electron microscope images, TEMs, of all of these to give you a visual of what they look like between our cells. And the last one, gap or communication junctions, these are channels that go from one cell to another and they're for materials to flow in between. So ions and monomers pass in between cells through these gap junctions. Uh, your heart tissue has lots of gap junctions in between the cells for ions, uh, molecules to move, and so do animal embryos. Lots of gap junctions so that materials can easily flow back and forth. So this concludes um, all the coverage of eukaryotic cells, their parts, their structures, from the organelles to the cytoskeleton to the extracellular matrix in animals to intercellular junctions in animals. So you've learned a lot about how we're put together. And indeed, if you go on and take anatomy and physiology, um, a lot of this material is going to come back and you're going to need to refer to it.